Welcome to Dorsey and Whitney's webinar on Bank Council Roundtable ESG and Fair Lending, a Strategic Analysis. I'd like to introduce Tom Kelly, a partner in Dorsey's Finance and Restructuring Group. Take it away, Tom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our May Bank Council Roundtable. Um, today, we're going to cover two topics uh, as they relate to banks and banking. The first is ESG. And that's going to be covered by Lanier Stapperstein, who is a partner in our New York office in our litigation group who specializes in representing banks, and Cam Wong, who is a partner in our Minneapolis corporate group and specializes in um, corporate governance and particularly um, representing banks in corporate governance uh, roles and M&A transactions. Um, then we'll move on to fair lending, where you will get the always reliable Joe Liniak, who uh, is uh, a partner in our Washington, D.C. and Southern California offices in finance and restructuring. And Aaron Bryan, who is a partner in our Minneapolis office in finance and restructuring. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Cam and Lanier to go through the ESG topic. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Tom. Um, <clears throat> well, welcome. Um, uh, ESG uh, certainly is a, a broad topic. Um, so we're gonna do our best to sort of hone it down onto the, the key elements. And um, I think what makes ESG particularly challenging is, is not only is it a broad topic, but uh, the Miles Law applies here, which is where you stand depends on where you sit. And by that, I mean, um, uh, regulators, lawyers uh, come to the issue with their own particular lens. Um, and what we will do today is try and break it down in terms of what matters to financial institutions. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, what we see here in the uh, in the next slide is um, it uh, we have we divided it into two. Um, we've divided it into two both the sort of the banking regulators view uh, and the SEC view. And the banking regulators, the federal regulators, whether it's the OCC, the Fed, FDIC, um, as well as state regulators, view ESG through the prism of safety and soundness. Uh, just as it is with AML, BSA related compliance, so too is it with ESG. And that is what you will hear from the banking regulators consistently, that it's a safety and soundness issue. Right? They don't have the power to impose carbon requirements, but what they do have, they have a mandate to ensure the safety and soundness of the banking system. Uh, the SEC um, comes to ESG from the, the perspective of disclosure, 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 disclosure. Um, and so the SEC will come to ESG with that particular lens. Um, now, there is a sort of Venn diagram. Obviously, there's an overlap between the two. You have publicly listed uh, banks that have both, you know, uh, are regulated by both the, by banking regulators as well as the SEC. Um, and, um, you know, you have banks who make disclosures um, and particularly in the ESG space where banks want to seem market compliant or, you know, in terms of industry um, uh, compliant. Uh, and we'll talk about the uh, ESG related initiatives they have. And that's something to be mindful of. I remember a few years ago, um, I teach a class at Fordham Law School on financial institutions. And we invited in a fairly senior person from the New York Fed, and he pointed out that um, they like it when um, financial institutions make statements about their ESG um, um, compliance and initiatives, because one is a good thing to do. And two, um, it actually expands the uh, scope and the jurisdiction of the New York Fed, because all of a sudden the bank is saying things that are not entirely accurate, um, then the Fed can look at that too. Um, so let's um, uh, let's take them in order. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, we'll focus on the banking regulators, uh, and then we'll move into the uh, the SEC. Um, 
uh, and we can narrow it further um, and we can focus on the E in ESG, which is the environmental uh, aspects. Uh, and that really is the main focus of the banking regulators right now in the ESG space. And in fact, it's probably one of the primary focuses of regulators um, in terms of banking right now. Um, that and, and cybersecurity are two very hot topics. Um, and so what, is, what does this mean? Um, ESG, understandably, is, uh, can be an amorphous topic. Uh, so, so what does it mean for financial institutions? Well, um, Nelly Liang, uh, who's the Undersecretary of Domestic Finance and Treasury, said recently, uh, climate change represents an existential threat to our economic, um, excuse me, our environment and ecosystems that is creating increasing and significant economic costs. And so that is the focus of the banking regulators, the financial impact uh, on the safety and soundness of the regulated institutions. So uh, the DFS, uh, New York's banking regulator, issued an open letter in October of 2020, where they pointed out that the aggregate cost of billion dollar natural disasters in the US quadrupled uh, from the 1980s to the 2010s. Um, the, uh, in the same uh, open letter, the DFS pointed out that the potential economic impact of environmental related um, uh, problems uh, in New York alone are staggering, right? And they come up with this stat that sing single multifamily residential homes in New York City worth $334 billion um, uh, are at a high risk of storm surges. Uh, so if you are a bank uh, and you lend to uh, those uh, residents uh, in the areas that are at risk of storm surges, your collateral could quite literally be uh, wiped out overnight. Uh, and so they're, they're trying to be, you know, in terms of practical, that's the type of thing, type of stuff that the regulators are focused on. How does climate change impact your business? Uh, all right, if we go to the next slide, please. So what do the regulators expect? Uh, well, the OCC is laser focused on the safety and soundness aspect of climate change. Now, that's not my term. Uh, it's the term of Michael Shu, who's the acting controller of the currency. Uh, and he said that during the uh, IIB annual conference in Washington, D.C., that I'm sure a number of you uh, on the webinar uh, participated in. I know that Joe and I did. Um, and um, he made it very clear um, that they are uh, laser focused on this issue. Uh, and what he said was to sort of give a bit more um, specifics is that he wants banks to identify, measure, monitor, and mitigate climate-related exposure and risk. And that was his mantra uh, during the speech. Identify, measure, monitor, and mitigate. Uh, and he said that three or four times during his speech, and it is in the various OCC guidance and the FDIC guidance as well that we'll, we'll get to. So, but... Um, I, the impression I got was that the OCC was certainly not expecting financial institutions to do all those right away. Uh, and based on what uh, the regulators were saying during the course of the IIB meeting and elsewhere, um, I think the key point now is identifying the key exposures and risks. They really are, we're at the identification stage, we're at the measuring stage uh, of um, you know, the, uh, the upward learning curve. And like most risk assessments, um, any given financial institution's risk profile will turn on its business model. Well, you know, where does it do business? Who does it do business with? Who does it lend to? What products and services does it offer? Um, so a, just like with AML, right? If you have you know, correspondent banking relationships uh, with Latin American Bank, your AML, um, um, you know, program will be different from those that have corresponding bank relationships with Middle Eastern banks. Uh, there are different risks associated with different geographic regions, as well as different types of business lines. Um, if we could go to the uh, next slide. Oh, um, uh, and just before jumping into this sidebar, you know, I was actually speaking to an OCC examiner last night. Um, and I asked her, you know, have you started examining on climate related risk yet? And she said uh, she hadn't um, and um, she didn't know uh, when 
she would start doing it. But she amplified the point that um, the other regulators at the, the OCC have emphasized that is coming. Um, and that they're very aware of it. So at some point, uh, the examiners at the bank are going to start asking the bank, what are your climate related risks? How big are they? And what are you doing about it? Um, so it is coming, not yet, but it is coming, which leads to this point. Um, uh, and it's a bit of a sidebar, I recognize. Is this a passing fact, right? Um, uh, is this something that will be here? But, you know, with the change, if there's a change of administration, a Republican administration comes in, will it, you know, fall by the wayside? And my sense is probably no. Certainly, that there are there are trends uh, in regulatory in the regulatory space. There's some things that are fashionable one year and not fashionable the next year. I, I get that, but I think this is here to stay um, for a number of reasons. Investors care, uh, voters care, or at least a segment of the voting population cares. The media cares. In fact, the media loves nothing more than a good greenwashing story to report on. Um, and then even if the federal regulators change their focus, right, a Republican administration comes in and there's a decrease of uh, focus on the environment, um, the state regulators are there. And in fact, the DFS, the New York Banking Regulator, was very active um, under the prior administration, almost directly because they felt that the uh, Trump administration was not doing enough. So they felt that they were feel, filling, the, uh, filling the gap. So you do have uh, state regulators, and then you also have geopolitical considerations, um, and you know the invasion of uh, Ukraine being you know top of that list. Um, and you know I understand it could go both ways that maybe we won't don't want to reduce our risk on uh, reliance on carbon fuels, uh, but I do think it also suggests that um, there is a strategic reason to move to sustainable and renewable. Uh, energy sources that make us less dependent on Russia and uh, other countries. And certainly uh, that applies um, to Europe, right, who is particularly struggling with that, with that issue. So I think this is, this is here to stay, is, is my sense. Um, all right, we can go to the next slide. Uh, now, we've been talking in general, you know, general terms so far. Maybe we can get a little bit more granular. Uh, and, I, and I hesitate to say it's getting too granular because we're not there yet by that. I mean, the regulators aren't there yet. Um, so um, there are a couple of documents that I think are worth your time reading. Uh, the first is the OCC's Principles for Climate-Related Financial Risk Management um, that was released in December. There's been pub public comments uh, that closed on February 14th. Uh, the FDIC uh, released a substantially similar statement um, of Principles for Climate-Related Financial Risk. Um, and I think you don't need to read both. I would probably do start with the OCC. Um, it's six or seven pages. I think it's worth your time and you'll get a pretty good feel for uh, where the OCC is heading. Um, but let me sort of summarize what I think are some of the themes from, um, from the OCC and the FDIC principles. And that first is, this is still pretty high level stuff. Right. They want to provide a high level framework for safe and sound management. Um, these are not granular by any stretch. Um, we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, it is focused, as the title of the uh, principles uh, suggests, uh, uh, at large banks. Um, and um, you know, the OCC said, look, it impacts all banks uh, that have a material exposure to you know, climate related financial uh, um, risks and products, um, but the OCC's principles were tar uh, targeted at the largest banks, those with over 100 billion in total consolidated assets. Um, public input uh, doesn't seem like the regulators are going in alone uh, and sought public uh, comment. Uh, the uh, FDIC's public comment period is open until June 3rd. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, speak to your trade association about getting something in on that if they haven't already. Um, the OCC seems to be moving cautiously. Um, they uh, amplified in the principles that they plan to you know, update uh, the guidance. They plan to incorporate feedback on the principles, cons consider lessons learned, uh, as well as what other jurisdictions are doing. So they're not, you know, this is not going to be something that happens overnight. Um, then uh, the final point is risk-based. Um, and so I think 
the good news is that the climate related analysis will sort of look similar to the other type of risk based analysis that the banks have to do um, in connection with sort of AML. Um, and, uh, and so the OCC said that it intends to appropriately tailor any resulting supervisory expectations to reflect differences in bank circumstances, such as complexity of operations and business models. So there will, will be, continue to be a risk-based approach. So it's building on existing principles, not necessarily creating uh, entirely a new one. I go to the next slide, please. Um, so there's been an interesting response to the OCC's draft principles. Uh, that there, there were many, many comment letters. I certainly did not and will not uh, summarize all of them. Uh, but a couple that may be worth your attention are the uh, we have the American Bar Association, who suggested that the OCC continue to take a principle-based approach that's based on you know this sort of flexible and iterative process, um, uh, which I think they will. Um, and you know, don't expand the scope of the guidance to mid-sized or community banks until more data is available, right? Because their point is, you know, you know, it's difficult to assess now based on current models the impact of climate change on assets, uh, and certainly it's very hard for the smaller banks to do that. Um, the IIB submitted something as well oh. as, as somebody who does a lot of work in the foreign bank space. I was particularly interested in what they were working on and. Actually, I reviewed and commented on a draft of the IIB's um, comment letter. Um, and, you know, they said not uh, sort of similarly, look, you know, this is still a work in progress. Uh, you know, the models are not necessarily complete or entirely robust. Um, they wanted to make sure this coordinated amongst uh, US and international regulators. And then there were some unique considerations for foreign banks, such as the hundred, you know, the, the threshold Did that apply to the bank on a global basis or to the, you know, the US uh, branches or agencies assets, um, which is you know, a fair question. Um, and there'll be many, uh, many other uh, um, types of uh, comments, but those are some ones that I thought were particularly interesting. Um, so uh, I think we'll move to the next slide and just one, uh, uh, oh yeah, and then there were, you know, other regulators. Uh, so it's not just the, um, the OCC and the FDIC, uh, the New York Fed has apparently, at least according to press reports, started telling big banks to, you know, detail the measures that taking to, you know, identify and mitigate uh, climate change risks on their balance sheets. DFS, as I mentioned before, has been very active in this space, um, even more active than the OCC. Um, and so they're very focused on that as well. So if you're regulated by the DFS, I'm sure you've seen the open letters, but they are very interested in this area. And I know Nina Chen, who's the Director of Sustainability and ESG at DFS is very well informed and very focused on this issue. Um, so you know, let me leave you with one practical takeaway because I think the thing that is frustrating about ESG is sort of it can be pretty amorphous, uh, particularly at this stage. Um, and I think, you know, I'm sure a number of banks are doing this already. In fact, I know some are, uh, but that is to identify someone um, whether it is a member of management or a committee um, of management um, or a board member, to start thinking about these issues. Um, you know, someone, uh, as I say to my associates when I give them a project, you know, somebody who lies awake at night thinking about, about this stuff. Um, you know, somebody who's thinking about this and thinking about what are our risks, what are our exposure. You know, if you're a bank that has 25% of your revenue derived from the fossil fuel industry, um, you may want to think about this um, and how you're going to deal with that risk as you transition away or as the economy transitions away from fossil fuels. Um, so somebody who can really sort of think, start at least be thinking about this stuff. Anyway, with that, let me hand it over to Pam, who will be talking about uh, the SEC. Thank you so much, Lanyard. And I have to agree with your point. This is no longer a, a passing pad. I do think this is a fundamental shift in how um, investors and other corporate stakeholders see um, company priorities. And so depending on the change in administration, we may, we may see a certain decline in momentum. But I, I don't think that ESG trends, in particular climate risk, is going to be going away for the long term. And uh, you, know, you made a few observations about how the bank regulators are very much focused on, on the larger banks for the time being. You know, what's striking about the SEC climate risk disclosure rulemaking 
is that while it's not going to cover foreign banks that are publicly listed on non-U.S. exchanges, uh, otherwise, if, if you're a reporting bank, if you're a public bank, uh, regardless of your size, you're, you're going to get, um, you know, you're, you're going to have to respond to the SEC disclosure rules. And, you know, even for private banks. Uh, so, um, you know, you're not in the immediate crosshairs, but to the extent that you have investors, you have stakeholders, these questions are very likely to come up for you. But, you know, let's take a step back. So uh, Lanyard and I are going to be talk talking about various agency initiatives and rulemakings. And a lot of the backdrop for this came out of President Biden's executive order on climate related financial risk, which was um, issued in May of 2021. It was a multi-agency order um, to advance disclosure of climate related financial risk and really urging agencies um, to promulgate rules that are gonna address both the physical and transition risks of climate change. And so what does that mean? Uh, you know, physical risks in a nutshell, those are your natural disasters, right? So how are events such as wildfires, hurricanes, tornadoes, floods, heat waves, how is that going to impact uh, a company's um, assets? You know, whether it's your manufacturing facilities, your offices, um, your other assets. And then the transition risks, those are really um, the potential liabilities and the potential losses that are associated with um, the economy's transition to a less carbon intensive economy. And so it may arise from the adoption of climate related regulatory policies. Uh, there could be climate related litigation. They may arise out of changing consumer preferences, uh, employee behavior, changes in business partners, um, and longer term shifts in, in market prices and technological changes. And just to be clear, these are not just risks, they're also opportunities for businesses as well. So I think we need to see both sides of the, of the coin there. And the executive order also urged agencies really to address acts to mitigate the risks that are identified. And so this order did result in an FSOC report calling for new disclosures and um, a variety of actions regarding climate risk across the federal financial regulatory agencies. And Lanyard, as you and I were talking about this before the presentation, you know, the financial services industry really is a linchpin for the administration's strategy on managing climate risk because uh, there is already a very developed and sophisticated risk management process at financial institutions. And because of their power to finance um, and their ability to reach across industries and into industries across the economy, really a linchpin for the administration's regulation of climate risk. So that's what happened in May. You know, fast forward a few months into October of 2021, and now you know, I'm gonna talk specifically about the SEC. That's when Chair Gary Gensler um, testified before the House Committee on financial services. And in this testimony, he uh, gave some indications of, of the themes that we saw carry through in the climate risk rulemaking. And so, you know, he said, today's investors are looking for consistent, comparable and decision useful disclosures around climate risk. Whereas, you know, in the current environment, there's a lot of different disclosure floating around. Um, it's very hard to compare disclosure um, between or among companies, but his goal is to make it more consistent uh, across companies. Uh, and so he urged the staff to develop proposals on these potential disclosures um, and to have that disclosure informed by economic analysis put out to public comment. So as I mentioned before, foreign banks won't be covered um, by this disclosure regulation, but if you're a public company bank, regardless of size, yes, you will be affected by it. Um, but the reality is most banks uh, will have relatively small carbon footprints but back to my point, you know, the fiscal and transition risks that are posed by climate change are going to profoundly impact the businesses that they finance. And so, you know, we're talking about credit risk. We're talking about reputational risk. Next slide, please. So uh, the proposed rulemaking was recently released and there's a lot of analysis and you know, a comment period is going on. But you know, one point I wanted to make for everyone, and you've already seen this, is that in the meantime, there's already quite a bit of ESG and particularly climate risk disclosure out there. And so as part of the SEC rulemaking, uh, the staff actually put together uh, this uh, bar chart of existing uh, ESG disclosure that they found through a keyword search of 2020 and 2021 annual reports. And what's interesting to me here um, 
are um, the industries where the disclosure is more prevalent. And, and maybe it's not all that surprising. You know, at, at the top, you're seeing you know, utilities, oil and gas, steel manufacturing, really carbon intensive um, industries, you know, towards the bottom, banking. In fact, I think it's second to last. And then also, you know, worth just paying attention to, to what type of disclosure is currently being offered. You know, it, it is about business and financial impact. Uh, to a lesser extent, you know, companies, perhaps some with the more sophisticated ESG programs are talking about emissions. They're talking about international climate accords. And they're also talking about physical risks. Um, but really maybe my point here is that uh, people should not be looking or waiting for the SEC rules to be finalized to pay attention to this issue. Because first of all, it's very likely the rulemaking is gonna be tied up in litigation and second, there are already resources out there that are much more user-friendly than any SEC filing is going to be and that have already captured the attention of your investors and stakeholders. And so uh, just as an example, I was looking at a website uh, that's investor-driven and investor-organized called uh, Climate Action 100. And it's, it's very user-friendly and it's a quick way to look at some large companies and very quickly through um, a drop menu you know, have access to their current governance policies, risk management policies, and their um, emissions metrics, uh, whether it's short, medium, or, or long-term. Uh, next slide, please. So that does bring us to the SEC's climate change rulemaking, which was uh, released in March of 2022. And so it is clearly their most extensive rulemaking in recent history. It's almost certainly likely to be challenged based on the agency's authority to prescribe such disclosures. And there will be a significant cost associated with the compliance with these disclosure rules. The SEC is estimating it's gonna be between five or $600,000 a year for your average reporting company. And actually Ceres uh, recently did some surveying and, and they kind of essentially backed up this estimate. I think this is, going to be a fairly reliable estimate about um, the cost that's gonna be associated with just the, the disclosure compliance alone. I mean, we're not even talking about you know, the rest of, of the ESG program that a company might be putting in place. And so, you know, what we're really talking about when, when we think about the disclosure that's going to be required if these rules pass, uh, we're talking about climate related risks um, and their actual or likely material impacts on the business strategy and outlook how the company governs climate-related risks and related risk management processes, greenhouse gas emissions. And so here, you know, everyone's heard about, you know, scope one, two, and three, you know, the, there are companies who maybe feel good about, you know, the scope one and having a grasp around that, the, the direct emissions from their operations, and maybe even scope two, uh, which would derive from, for example, emissions from purchased electricity and other forms of energy. You know, scope three is something that a lot of companies are, are still grappling with. So, you know, it's emissions that are related to upstream and downstream activities in the value chain. And so that's still, I think, a, an evolving area for, for a lot of companies. Just, I mean, <laughs> you're, you're already in great shape if you have scope one and two. A lot of companies don't have a grasp on that. Scope three is, is kind of very much at the frontier. Uh, and then, you know, just moving down the checklist of things the rule would cover, you know, climate-related financial statement metrics, and also information about climate-related targets and goals. The SEC set a very, very ambitious comment period for these rules. I mean, considering the scope and the significance, they initially um, provided only 39 days for comment period. Now, they recently extended that to June, but they, it, I think this shows they are very motivated to finalize this rulemaking and get it in place um, before there's a change in administration or other circumstances that could potentially fog it down. Uh, next, please. So you know, Lanyard talked a little bit about um, you know, the OCC. I've talked about the SEC. Oh, um, could you go back actually to the prior? Yes, thank you. Um, you know, and so yes, there, there are forces that are pushing for more disclosure, um, more governance, more risk management around uh, climate change. But we also have to realize, you know, um, 
businesses are operating in a very complicated political environment. So if we look at the state level, actually, there are states that are pushing back on these types of climate policies. So for example, in Texas, the uh, comptroller there is demanding that more than 140 financial firms disclose their climate policies um, and whether they restrict or prohibit doing business with energy companies. Uh, and so this was in response to a law that the Texas government passed last year uh, where he would have to maintain a list of these financial companies and, and basically boycott them um, and uh, you know, deny state contracting opportunities to financial institutions that exercise a policy that's called negative screening. That's when you know, they're, they're looking at um, their loan portfolio and they are excluding certain applicants based on the industry that they're in. Uh, and the expectation actually is that the list of financial services firms that can pass muster under this Texas legislation is, is fairly small. Um, and then even beyond Texas, you know, Utah and West Virginia are pushing back against ESG ratings and the Arizona Attorney General, uh, Mark Brnovich announced plans to launch an antitrust investigation into money managers, lenders, and other firms that have taken steps to identify and reduce the financial risks of climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to just take a quick pivot here um, to end my part of the presentation. A lot of us has, have heard about net zero pledges. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> a lot of companies have adopted them, um, particularly the larger companies. In fact, nearly 33% of our largest public companies uh, have adopted them last year, which is a significant increase from, from the prior year. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's kind of important for us to understand you know, what are the ground rules? What are people actually committing themselves to here? Uh, and so as a backdrop, in order to reach the Paris goal, the, the Paris Climate Accord of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade, companies are pledging to limit carbon emissions so that the level of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere does not rise any further after 2050. And exactly what are they committing to? Uh, so one type of commitment that they may be making is to reduce carbon emissions from their business activities. Um, so limiting the use of fossil fuels are just becoming more energy efficient. Uh, a second position or action that companies may take, and at this point, I believe this is you know, quite common, is to invest in carbon offsets that reduce overall carbon emissions. And so this is investing in renewable energy projects or other initiatives that uh, help to control carbon emissions, but these investments are outside of the company's own operations. And um, you know, these carbon offsets and carbon credits are actually, frankly, quite controversial. So uh, for example, just last week, I was reading about, uh, there are these tracts of forests in Michigan and Wisconsin um, that uh, you know, they are going to be able to sell carbon credits to companies based on, you know, the, the, um, based on just having those tracts of lands and those trees there to, to offset carbon emissions. But the reality is, you know, they're, they're not actually doing anything different. It's the same, you know, tracts of land, same forest. They're just, you know, getting a certification. and Now they're able to, you know, issue these credits. So it's almost more of a, a, a marketing and, and, and a business strategy rather than any real change um, to improve the climate. And, you know, the other source of skepticism is that, uh, so, you know, these net zero pledges uh, have goals associated with them. And these goals often, you know, they run out to 2050. Well, the people who are making these goals right now are executives who would actually don't have to live with the consequences and actually see these goals actually fulfilled in 2050. So they're longer term, you know, people are asking questions. Okay, even if you have longer term uh, metrics and goals, you know, what are your short-term metrics and goals? What about interim goals as well? And so, uh, you know, there are carbon emissions reductions activities, uh, there are carbon offsets, and also, you know, there are initiatives to explore removing carbon emissions from the environment, uh, reforestation, I think I mentioned that, carbon capture technology. Um, so hopefully that gives everyone a little bit more of an understanding about what is involved in making a net zero pledge and how companies are, are getting to that point. And I did include a graphic in here just quickly to reemphasize the point that while companies feel generally more comfortable about where they are in ter terms of scope one and two emissions, it's really the scope three emissions across the value chain that um, remains an unknown.
Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erin and Joe for the fair lending segment of our presentation. Great. Thank you, Pam. I'm going to kick off our fair lending segment by discussing how we got here and what's at stake for financial institutions. Next. The Biden administration has loudly and clearly signaled its intent to aggressively enforce federal fair lending laws. CFPB Director Chopra has emphasized redlining, fintech, and AI underwriting in recent remarks, all of which could be found to evidence unlawful discrimination. Notably, however, from a purely data-driven perspective, the CFPB's own reporting would not seem to support these concerns. The few enforcement actions have been relatively minor and there have been few DOJ referrals. That may be in part due to the fact that banks have already devoted significant resources to statistically reviewing fair lending performance. Now those enhancements may be put to the test if disparate treatment once again becomes a priority driven by policy and equity considerations. Next and next. For the eight years of the Obama administration, it was clear that fair lending enforcement was a top priority. We saw strong interest in fair lending enforcement from the CFPB, DOJ, HUD, and federal prudential banking regulators. Consequently, banks have devoted significant resources to analyzing lending patterns for evidence of discriminatory conduct based upon a disparate impact statistical analysis. And much of that analysis has been concentrated on home mortgage lending. We then saw a lull in enforcement during the last administration. But as you all know, fair lending enforcement is back and reinvigorated. In recent months especially, we've seen Biden officials addressing discriminatory practices in a much broader context than we've ever seen before. And it's raised a lot of questions that have yet to be answered. Next. So how did we get here? The primary source of federal fair lending law is the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, uh, which is implemented by the CFPB's Regulation B. ECOA prohibits discrimination in any aspect of a credit transaction on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, marital status, or age. In the fairly recent Bostock decision, the US Supreme Court expanded the scope of federal discrimination based upon sex to include sexual orientation and gender identity. ECOA also prohibits discrimination on the basis that a person's income is from public assistance or because a right has been exercised under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. There are two notable exceptions. ECOA permits creditors to favor applicants who are 62 years or older, and it permits the establishment of special purpose credit programs. We have received a lot of questions about those types of programs in the past year. Next. A second major source of federal fair lending law is the Fair Housing Act, implemented by HUD regulations. The Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in all aspects of residential real estate related transactions, including the making of loans. Specifically, it bars discrimination on the basis of race or color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. Next. Both ECOA and the Fair Housing Act apply to residential mortgage lending. However, ECOA also applies to all categories of lending, including commercial lending, non-residential lending, and the CFPB has finally proposed issuing regulations to implement Section 1071 of the Dodd-Frank Act for women and minority-owned small businesses. Next. Lending discrimination claims fall into three buckets. The first is overt or intentional discrimination which has become much less common. For example, this would include a banker telling a female applicant that she would not be eligible for a loan because she is female and the bank does not want to make loans to women. Then there's disparate treatment, which may be evidenced by statements revealing that a creditor explicitly considered prohibited factors. Disparate treatment 
may be found where differences in treatment are not fully explained by legitimate non-discriminatory factors. And finally, there's disparate impact. This may be found where lending policies are applied equally, but nevertheless disproportionately advantage certain persons on a prohibited basis. If there is a disparate impact, the lender must show that the policy or practice serves a legitimate business purpose. Next. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about what disparate treatment actually means um, because this has become a significant issue in recent years. With disparate treatment, there's an allegation of discrimination on a prohibited basis in a manner that the creditor's decision-making process resulted in the individual being treated differently because of the identified prohibited basis. In order to establish this, a court can look at direct evidence or circumstantial evidence which might include statistical regression analysis, um, looking at the number of people who are members of a protected class, uh, looking at applications for credit for which the borrower was qualified, um, findings that a rejection was made despite qualifications, uh, a creditor that continued to approve credit for similarly situated applicants or borrowers who are not members of the protected class, matched pair analysis, um, mystery shopping, so sending people in, for instance, to a bank to make an application. Um, and then a modified test would be necessary to prove reverse red line. Next. In a disparate impact case, the borrower has not been treated differently based upon a prohibited basis, but the effect of the creditor's practice is to adversely impact a protected class. Traditionally, disparate impact has been proven by statistically comparing the acceptance and rejection rates of a protected group with the acceptance and rejected rates of all applicants in the loan pool. Courts have often employed a but-for test. In other words, but for the status of the applicant or borrower as a member of a protected class, the applicant or borrower would have received financing or would have received it on more favorable terms. Next. While some lenders have argued that disparate impact was not available to prove a fair lending claim based upon some ambiguity in ECOA and the FHA, that legal position has been soundly rejected by the Supreme Court in the 2016 decision, Texas Department of Community Affairs versus Inclusive Communities Project, Inc. In the Inclusive Communities decision, the court held that disparate impact is available to prove a fair lending violation. Perhaps even more significantly, the court identified a burden shifting test that should apply. Next. During the last administration, HUD interpreted the Inclusive Communities decision in a manner that arguably diminished the effectiveness of disparate impact. However, its disparate impact standard rule was almost immediately enjoined by a federal court. After the change in administrations on June 25, 2021, HUD proposed to rescind the Trump era rule and to reinstate and restate its 2013 rule on disparate impact. Next. The reinstated burden, burden shifting test works as follows. First, the plaintiff has the burden of proving that a challenged practice caused or predictably will cause a discriminatory effect. Second, once the plaintiff satisfied this, satisfies this initial burden of proof, the defendant has the burden of proving that the challenged practice is necessary to achieve one or more substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interests of the respondent or defendant. And finally, if the defendant satisfies this burden of proof, the plaintiff may still prevail upon proving that the substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interests supporting the challenge practice could be served by another practice that has a less discriminatory effect. Next. In terms of examination and enforcement, the CFPB is the agency with the primary authority to enforce ECOA against most financial institutions including banks, credit unions, and other depository institutions over $10 billion, mortgage lenders, mortgage servicers, payday lenders, and virtually all non-bank lenders. Dodd-Frank had created within the CFPB the Office of Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity, 
which was partially dismantled during the previous administration, but has now been reconstituted. Next. In addition, the federal banking agencies have primary examination authority for banks of 10 billion and less. They have concurrent or co-equal examination authority for banks, holding companies, and affiliates. Comparable state agencies have similar authority. For example, the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation may directly enforce federal consumer protection laws and state anti-discrimination laws. The federal agencies can either take direct enforcement action or make a referral to the Department of Justice. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe Liniak to discuss the most recent developments. Sorry about that. I had to uh, undo my microphone. Thank you very much, Aaron. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and and at, as a starting point, we're, we're we're reemphasizing and summarizing uh, where fair lending has been. And I, I think an important point is that the industry, the banking industry for the last eight years has done a formidable job in compliance for fair lending. Uh, however, uh, fair lending is probably not your parents' fair lending going back uh, the 20 year period when it has been emphasized. Uh, however, what, what have we done? Well. Uh, it's important for mortgage lending because there's data. And data is ultimately very, very important for purposes of pro proving fair lending discrimination or proving that it's not. And that's Humda, and that's Humda reporting. And we do it very, very well. We're very, very skilled at it. It's published every year. Uh, and uh, individuals are able to take the information electronically and slice and dice and they're really, you know, the, the industry uh, deserves a gold star for what they've done in terms of picking up the cudgel and, and doing the work on, uh, on disparate impact, which is really how, which has really been our focus. In October, uh, the new uh, head of the CFPB made numerous statements, uh, and actually he continues to make numerous statements about discriminatory conduct that he believes is out there uh, and it's not quite clear why it is he's saying these things, but he's doing it anyway. Uh, and, and I've got some real serious concerns as to whether or not he should be making these statements. Uh, but uh, in any event, he is. Uh, and um, one of the things that he has pointed out is uh, his concern about redlining and stated that it's an endemic problem requiring all hands on deck with enforcement from across the federal government, uh, uh, state governmental ed entities, and the CFPB will continue uh, its mission to root out all forms of redlining. And then immediately, the Attorney General Garland announced a new combating redlining initiative mm -hmm. and said the same similar mm -hmm. types of things. Uh, very, very interesting, but as we well may see, uh, is this real or is this something that uh, 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 Mr. Chopra has come up with because he's been eating magic mushrooms. We'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Next slide, please. What is redlining? Well, it 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 it, it uh, refers to the practice of refusing to make mortgage loans to otherwise creditworthy borrowers based upon geographic areas. Uh, historically, you just take a pen and you say we're not going to lend in the Irish American area because we don't like Irish. Uh, but now it has really migrated to, in, to really focus in on the so-called discouragement theory, that you do things to discourage Irish Catholics from applying for a mortgage loan because we don't want them in our neighborhoods. Uh, and it can take the form of word symbols, models, uh, advertising to suggest um, that someone should not apply for a particular loan. Uh, and it can be looked at statistically in order to be able to prove it. Uh, let's go to the next the next slide. Uh, in terms of redlining, advertising. Here we got a picture of Bob White and his very, very white family. And that's the only um, picture that we advertise in the newspapers. We do it on the good side of town and not on the bad side of town because we want white applicants. And uh, this will get you in trouble. 
And you've probably seen that people have picked up on this and we now see many more uh, groups of people that should be qualifying for a loan. Uh, but this is advertising discrimination, discouraging people from applying. Uh, next, next slide, please. And, and here what we have are a potpourri of so-called discriminatory actions that the CFPB has been spouting out about that you as banks and other lenders have to really be aware of. Uh, and we're gonna go to an important point regarding disparate impact in a moment. Well, it involves redlining, uh, possibly re uh, reverse redlining, refusing to make a mortgage loan, discrimination in appraising property. That is a real, real big deal according to Shopper right now. Refusing to purchase loans, maternity to leave discrimination, disability discrimination, discouragement in advertising and marketing that we just mentioned, treating borrowers differently in servicing loans, which was a very important component and criticized very heavily as a result of the COVID crisis. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, other things which have been criticized as possibly being out there and evidence, evidencing discriminatory uh, uh, conduct. And again, some of these are, uh, uh, are highly questionable. Lack of diversity of loan products offered. So if you do not offer a, uh, a, a loan product which may be available and, uh, and beneficial to a, uh, a, uh, a low-income person, is that this necessarily discrimination? Where do you purchase your loans from? Do you have a, a, an adequate compliance management system for, um, uh, uh, to avoid uh, redlining and discriminatory conduct? Where do you locate your branch offices? This is now being picked up around the country, not only for banks, but for non-banks as well. And several states have come up with branching issues, linking it to Community Reinvestment Act for non-banks. And then finally also, what are you doing in terms of the, uh, the development of automated systems or AI for underwriting and analyzing loans. Um, we're actually going to be doing a program for the Mortgage Bankers Association next week talking about AI, the, the analytics involved, uh, uh, because again, this is becoming something which uh, if you have got an AI system or if you're developing it, you have to have the expertise in-house to be able to look at it, to understand the model development uh, and so forth. But the point that I, I was referencing a moment ago is that in most cases, these are really disparate treatment issues, not disparate impact issues. And the data is not readily available. And so the point is, where do you get the data? How difficult it is it to get the data? What is your obligation to ensure that disparate treatment issues that are occurring are not occurring at your shop? And do you test for them? Next, uh, next slide. Um, and again, because I like to criticize the CFPB because the, uh, they're worthy of it. Uh, as, as Aaron mentioned, uh, they're yelling the sky is falling, and yet their enforcement actions do not support fair lending concerns from a data-driven perspective. There have been very, very few enforcement actions. There have been very, very few DOJ referrals. There have been a few but some of them go back through for several years. Some of them do not even refer to banks. They refer to non-bank non -bank entities. And some of the things are, you sit back and say, we would never do that, but it's pretty obvious why uh, they were criticized or they were penalized. Uh, Touchstone Financial, which is still in litigation, uh, they were advertising apparently solely on a radio station that uh, uh, was extraordinarily uh, conservative and, prob and probably disencouraged uh, minorities from, uh, uh, from listening. Washington Financial, they incorrectly reported Humda data. Okay, well, um, you know, it's, again, $200,000, uh, you know, I mean, come on, guys. I mean, that's, that, that's not going to be, uh, create a real big deal. Trustmark Bank and Cadence Bank, again, some issues, but again, when you take a look at what, what the settlements were and the number of issues, it's not really significant. And so the question is, how do you balance all of that out 
for purposes of uh, your compliance programs. Next, uh, next slide. Uh, well, you probably need to go back and take a look at these things that have been criticized, things which are uh, dis possibly disparate treatment. And you got to look at your compliance management systems. You've got to have fair lending policies and procedures. You've got to take a look at advertising because that has now become a very big deal. You've got to look at things such as loan pricing differentials, well-documented denials under ECOA. Why did you deny it? Uh, is there a basis for it? That does impact, uh, disparate impact. Uh, and if you have complaints, do you address them? You have to have training and communication. You've got to correct problems and you've got to continue monitoring and reporting. Next slide. Uh, uh, and you and you got to make sure that it goes up the ladder to the uh, uh, to the board of directors and and to management. We've only got a few moments left, but we wanted to uh, uh, grease the skids by uh, just indicating the fact that last week the, uh, uh, the the agencies came out with their long anticipated CRA joint proposal, and we are going to be talking about this in depth. Uh, next month, but we want to give you a taste of what's in it. Next slide. Uh, the CRA is old, and um, I'm actually as old as the CRA, because I started practicing the year, uh, the year before it was adopted when I was at the FDIC. Uh, and for the first decade or so, really not a whole lot happened. There were regulations, but nobody seemed to care a whole lot until Bill Clinton came along, and he adopted the current test for evaluating performance of CRA, the lending test, the deposit test, the service test. And then over a period of years, a small bank asset size uh, exemption and uh, liberalization occurred, uh, 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 exemptions for wholesale institutions uh, and uh, the ability to have a, a strategic plan. Uh, next, next slide. Uh, and you have ratings and the ratings were used to them outstanding satisfactory needs to improve. Um, uh, next slide, please. And, and why does, does it become important? Well, it becomes important because this is probably the biggest tool that a consumer group has to hold a bank hostage if you're doing a merger. Uh, all they need to do is send in a letter saying, we think they do not have a good CRA performance rating and the federal, and the federal regulators will stop considering a transaction. Uh, a merger transaction, a purchase of assumption, things that CAM does uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it it stops in its tracks, and they say to you, "Go and deal with the regulate. Uh, don't go and deal with the consumer groups, and until you do so, we are not going to approve your transaction." And as you can see, it's uh, definitely not particularly well liked by bank management that wants to do their particular deal. Next slide. Um, the OCC radically revamped the. Uh, CRA, but they went off on their own and they abandoned the other agencies uh, in 2020. And they came up with uh, with a proposal which actually had some very, very useful components to it, such as uh, giving clarity as to what is a qualified CRA investment, coming up with a new alternative test for where your deposits are located, and also allowing you to, in advance, uh, provide uh, rather uh, obtain uh, confirmation that your, your proposed investment in a community would receive CRA credit. Next slide. Uh, and what happened was once uh, the Obama, uh, I'm sorry, the Biden administration came in, uh, they revoked the authority and it's now dead. And, but the, ag the agencies have now come out with a new CRA notice. It is really important. Uh, it is going to uh, require a great deal of work. We really suggest that uh, somebody take a look and read all 600 pages of, uh, 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 of information. And they've, they've tweaked the, the, uh, the tests, they've created benchmarks, and they've created waste, weights for each individual best benchmark. It is probably going to be complicated. But it uh, it will and it's being led by the Fed, who opposed the OCC in addressing the uh, 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 when the OCC went on its way uh, uh, two years ago. So this is going to become very very important for us. It is since it's only been amended the CRA 
uh, twice in its history. Whatever gets adopted here, uh, we're gonna be living with uh, uh, for the foreseeable future. Next slide. I'm gonna now turn it over to Tom Kelly for closing remarks. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, and as Joe mentioned, we will be doing a June roundtable to address specifically the new CRA proposals. Um, if you have questions about today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to any of the presenters for, uh, for clarification. Materials and signing are available for download and the program will be available on our website, although the recorded program does not provide for professional education credits. Uh, we hope everyone will join us next week. Thanks again for coming today. And uh, I hope everyone has a great month and we'll see you next month.